Thank you. Um, so this is an intentionally provocative title because um, I found that uh, I have more fun in talks if they're uh, at least half discussion rather than talk. So here's the plan. Um, you know, I'm going to start out by making a statement. I'm going to follow that up with a question and then um, you know, complete it with an entirely incomplete answer, um, followed by heckling. And, and what I'm hoping is that I can get through those first three things in about 15 minutes, leaving a full 15 minutes of heckling. Um, or if you guys do your jobs correctly, uh, there will be just a constant stream of heckling, and that will be much yeah, more yeah. fun. Uh, yeah, I was looking at you. Dr. Nick, too. I'm, I'm you know. So um, here's the statement, is that web apps do not work the same way they did in 2004. Good. Yes. Um, you know, and uh, so if I, you know, still today, if, if, if I were trying to describe sort of how a web app works, I probably would say something like, well, you know, you make a request to the, you know, when you log in, you make a request, your browser makes a request for the server, and it returns a response with a bunch of HTML, and then the browser renders that HTML, and probably embedded in that HTML are a bunch of anchor tags that become links and have URLs associated with them, and when the user clicks on one of those links, then it makes another request for that URL, and the browser gets a whole bunch more HTML, and it renders, and we've got a new page, right? Is that approximately how you, know, you guys would describe how a web app works? I mean, there's forums and stuff too, right? But that's the, you know, so, so me too, but it's lies. At least for, for the web apps that I build now, it's lies. And increasingly, for the web apps that people are building, it's lies. Um, that's how it worked in 2004. That's not how it works in 2010. So a lot of web apps now, um, you know, you make a request to the server, you get back a huge wad of JavaScript and maybe a little bit of HTML, um, and then that's it. That sits there in the browser for the entire session, right? You don't click on a link and go to a different URL and get back a bunch more uh, HTML. You click on a link and that has some JavaScript handler that maybe fires off a background request that gets back a bunch of JSON, right? Um, and uh, you don't have this kind of big URL structure of your app, at least not in any form that the server sees, um, you might change the URL in the location bar, but actually it's all done through location hashes, right? It's after the, the hash in the URL. Uh, it's not something that ever goes into the request. Um, so examples of apps that work this way, um, new Twitter, uh, which just came out like yesterday or whatever, um, Google Instant Search, uh, which is you know, also quite recent, uh, Trendly, which I just have up there because it's an app that I built last year. Um, Etherpad, uh, which is awesome. Uh, Gmail is kind of the canonical example of an app that works this way. Um, and for a lot of these, it's not just that uh, they're more responsive um, when, uh, when they're, they work this way or that you know, it was a little easier to build or whatever uh, when they work this way. It's that they truly couldn't have been built any other way, right? Google Instant Search wouldn't make sense as a kind of traditional multi-page web app, right? I mean, you can kind of think of the original Google Search as a multi-page web app because each time you hit search or page through the results, you are actually taken to a new URL and you know, it is a new request and the browser fully re-renders the page, right? Um, Etherpad, you know, I don't know how many of you guys used Etherpad. Um, it sort of disappeared when it got acquired by Google, but, but it still exists. It's open source and it's up there. It's an awesome app. It's like sub edit on the web. You could not do this without having a huge amount of client-side JavaScript, right? Um, and Gmail, you probably could build you know, another way, but it does feel much better and more responsive having it built that way. Um, let's take new Twitter as an example, and, and, and I should um, add as a disclaimer, um, although I do now work at Twitter, I had absolutely nothing to do with new Twitter. Um, but I think it's totally awesome and was built the way that web apps should be built. Um, uh, also a disclaimer, nothing I say is necessarily the opinions of my employer, blah, blah, blah. Um, even though I'm going to use them as an example. So let's actually look at what happens with new Twitter. So here's um, a search on new Twitter for Gogaru Co. Um, and there we go, rotten fruit basket at my feet. And if I click this, um, what's going to happen is we're going to get a request that returns a bunch of JSON, right? And everything I do here, you know, I click here, uh, I'm going to get another request with a bunch of JSON, right? And that's all that's going on. This is a big JavaScript app that every single click that you do the entire time you're using new Twitter is just making another request for another JSON file that it's then going to use 
to you know, add stuff to its UI, right? And you can see the URL here, this is the URL, right? Twitter.com, period, is the URL. There are no other URLs in this app. I mean, there are background ones, but not ones that the user sees or cares about, right? Everything else is just after the hash. Um, so no matter what I do here, that's going to be true, right? Um, so that's a fundamentally different way of building web apps than the way that we are all probably used to building web apps. And uh, let's get that keynote here. Um, so why did I mention 2004? 2004 is when Basecamp and Rails came out, right? Um, 2004 is the world for which Rails was designed. And when the fundamental design decisions that went into Rails were made, and those fundamental design decisions, I would say, uh, you know, have continued to this day, right? You can't change the fundamental design decisions necessarily uh, without rethinking from the ground up. When those design decisions were made, this was the world that we built web apps in. And that is not the world that we are in now, and certainly not the world that we're going to be moving into. Um, 2004 is also interesting because uh, actually someone was doing web apps that way back then. Um, and that's Google, because Gmail came out in 2004, and Gmail blew me away, and probably blew a lot of other people away too. Uh, but the reason that no one else did it back then is that it was really, really hard to do. And Google had the resources uh, and the guts to do it, um, but very few other people did. And, and that's changed, and it's changed for a few reasons. Um, a couple of things that I think have been especially essential. One is jQuery or uh, you know, other uh, JavaScript frameworks like jQuery, but I think jQuery deserves kind of a special call out. Um, jQuery removes a huge amount of the pain of doing cross-browser JavaScript development and a huge amount of the pain of working with the DOM and so on, uh, which doesn't have very good APIs to begin with. Um, the other thing I think that deserves a special call out is Chrome. Um, not to say that everyone necessarily uses Chrome, because the market share is still relatively small, but Chrome acts as a huge force pushing the rest of the industry to catch up and, with their JavaScript implementations. Um, it's important to remember that JavaScript in 2004 was a really slow language, right? All the implementations of JavaScript were quite slow, probably slower, for example, even than MRI is um, at running dynamic languages. Uh, these days, this is just a chart I pulled from the language shootout, you know, V8, the JavaScript implementation in Chrome, runs uh, up to 100 times faster on some goofy benchmarks than MRI does, right? Um, but in all of them, it's a lot faster, right? So, uh, you know, you can, you can think about the amount of data that you're transferring uh, between your, your web app and the browser, um, and it may actually be faster, rather than doing a bunch of computation on the server, to send it down to the browser where they have a fast execution engine uh, they can do a bunch of computation for you, rather than your slow, pokey execution engine that you have on the server side, right? I'm serious. If you're doing like a bunch of statistical analysis on the data or something, you may actually be better to do that in JavaScript uh, on the client than you are to do it in Ruby on the server, uh, which is goofy, but it's interesting. Um, and just this is, uh, I, I love the um, URL of the site. This is arewefastyet.com. Um, this is Mozilla's page where they track their JavaScript implementation, but it's just up there as an example of how sort of Chrome uh, has pushed the rest of the industry to make their JavaScript engines faster and faster, and IE is doing the same thing in IE9 to try to catch up uh, with the awesome uh, <coughs> Smalltalk engineers that built uh, V8. Um, so here's the question. Um, the question is, how should we change the 2004 design, that is to say Rails and Rails-like frameworks, to work for 2010 web apps? And uh, you know, as, as I promised, I do not have an answer for this, right? I have one tiny, partial, incomplete, tiny piece of an answer to this that, you know, just so that I'd think something interesting. But um, mostly this is just a question. Um, and if we think about sort of model view controller, you know, model, um, it's interesting to talk about the NoSQL stuff um, because I think the way people think about models is changing, uh, but that's totally out of the scope of this talk, so I'm just going to ignore it. Um, view, you know, you can think about no HTML, right? Uh, these apps are, are no HTML apps in the sense, not obviously that there isn't HTML involved in some part of the process, but in the sense that the server side, the web framework uh, sitting on the server, is not generating HTML, it's generating JSON, most likely, as what it you know, serves to the browser, right? Um, and so what's the view doing, right? There isn't really a view 
uh, you know, uh, ERB templates or whatever template system you use, it just doesn't make sense in this context if what you're serving is basically a data structure rather than a view. So, so sort of the notion of view has to go out the window and controller, uh, whoops, I lost my controller slide, fun. Um, well, anyway, there's supposed to be a slide in there that says controller uh, and no URL, right? Uh, because if you have, for example, with new Twitter, where the only URL in the system, or the only user visible URL in the system is twitter.com slash, then, you know, where are your roots, right? Uh, where are all your controller actions? Uh, I mean, maybe you have some, a some for a an API somewhere, but uh, the idea of clean URLs is irrelevant, right? Because there is exactly one URL, and that's slash. Uh, so, so the whole, you know, kind of structure that, that the framework builds up around controllers um, doesn't necessarily make any sense anymore. So, you know, we have to reconsider model. Uh, we've thrown away view, and we maybe need to throw away controller. Um, maybe it's time to rethink the framework. And, and that's kind of the question that I'm putting is, you know, what, what can we do uh, to, to build something that, that recognizes sort of these realities of, of how we do um, web apps now? Um, for the incomplete answer, uh, I just want to talk about basically one trick. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and it's a useful trick, but it's just one trick. Um, and I'm going to switch to a text editor to, to talk about it. Um, so uh, people who have seen me talk before may know that I hate templates. Um, but uh, you, know, you can imagine, uh, let's say, OK, you know, I have this model. I'm getting a bunch of JSON from the server. And then I'm going to you know, build a UI on the client. Well, I'm used to doing that with templates, so I might do that with templates on the client side. So let's say I'm just trying to render a list of items and uh, for each of them, you're going to have a link. And when you click on that link, something happens with the item. It doesn't really matter what. Right? So with a template, you probably have something like this. And this is kind of a vaguely mustache-like theoretical template. Right? Um, and, uh, and the thing that I hate about this, uh, among other things, is that we're still dealing with marshalling things to text and back. Right? Um, and this is one thing that, that I always sort of went on about when I was talking about Seaside, is that you shouldn't have to constantly be worrying about, OK, I have this object, and basically I want to deal with the object. And now I have to find some way to represent it as you know, an ID or something. And then a second later, you know, I'm going to have to do another manual lookup from that ID back to the object. Right? But that's what's going on here if you have a template. You've got to boil it down to text. And so I've got to say, OK, you know, what's this item's ID? And then when that handler actually gets triggered, I have the ID. And now I have to somehow find a way to pull back the item. Right? Um, if we're all in JavaScript, you know, it should be obvious that we really don't have to do this. And, uh, and we could, for example, build this just in jQuery, which is this top thing. Um, just build the DOM elements directly, right, rather than having a template. And the nice thing about that is I can be in this for each loop with the item. Um, and I can attach the handler, and I have a, a closure, right, where I can see the item. And so my handler can just directly refer to the item, you know, the particular item in the loop, and I don't have to worry, it doesn't even have to have an ID. I don't have to worry about how I map this to some ID or some kind of textual representation and back. I just use the object, and my handler is going to get the object directly. And that's great, and that's really nice to write that way, and it's actually one of the major benefits of doing this JavaScript stuff. Now, I would clean up the you know, building API here and have something uh, maybe a little nicer. This down below is sort of uh, something that I'm hacking on. It's totally incomplete, but uh, a, a possible API for doing this kind of thing. And the details don't really matter, but it's just to show that you don't have to use the kind of somewhat verbose jQuery stuff directly. OK, uh, this is nice. Uh, there is a huge problem with this. Um, <laughs> So it turns out um, every other browser can do this really, really quickly. Right? Creating DOM elements is totally fast and fine, and you can like, have a huge page, and you build it up DOM element by DOM element. There's not a problem. IE can't do this. Or rather, if you try to do this in IE, it is going to be slow. Um, and so unfortunately, unless you can just say, you know, none of my users are going to use IE, this doesn't work. Um, or if you can say, my pages are going to be small and not have very many elements. But that's not ne you know, necessarily, uh, you know, if you have one big canvas or VML or whatever the IE equivalent, yeah, VML uh, element, and you know, maybe it'll work. But if you've got a fairly complex actual HTML page, it's not going to work. Um, IE 9, at least of the latest beta that I've tried, this is still a problem, right? They just, for whatever reason, they cannot make inserting DOM elements into the page fast. 
And it's like, it's not like a little slower, it's like a hundred times slower than the rest of the browsers, right? Um, and so the one little uh, trick that I wanted to share with you guys is um, how you get around this. Um, and for IE uh, and all other browsers, inner HTML is still fast, right? So you can build up text uh, and, and add that to the current DOM quickly. Um, but now we're back to text and templates and all that ugly stuff, right? Um, and so the trick is that you still have a builder API, uh, just like this one I was just showing you, right? Um, and, uh, and as you are building up your uh, DOM, you're not actually creating DOM elements, you're just creating little snippets of text, but every time you have a handler that you need to like associate a closure with something, you don't actually put that into the text. Instead what you do is you auto-generate an ID and you assign that to the element, right? So, you know, this list item doesn't need an ID, but I'll just give it an ID, a numeric ID. And as you're doing this, you build up an object that says, okay, this ID has these handlers, right? And then at the end, uh, once you've got this snippet and you've used inner HTML to install it into the DOM, then you just go back and you fix everything up, right? So you iterate through your map of sort of deferred handlers and you uh, get the elements by ID and then you stuff the handlers into them, right? And that, i.e., and all the other browsers can do quickly. Um, and so, you know, it turns out that you can sort of have the best of both worlds in that you can use the speed of uh, sort of concatenating together a bunch of snippets of text into HTML and using inner HTML while still letting you build your handlers that have all of the references to local scope uh, and have this kind of much nicer programming model. Um, so I think that that's my uh, 15 minutes of talking time and now I have my 15 minutes of heckling time. Um, I may have, you know, might be 2010. But, um, but anyway, um, please, uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions or, you know, rotten eggs. Uh, yes? It's not a full answer, but what do you think? Why, why don't you get up and use the microphone? Oh, sorry. Uh, it's not a full answer, but what do you think of frameworks like Sammy that try to organize the, the, the you know, anchors on the JavaScript side more into URLs? Uh, Sammy, did you say? Sammy, S-A-M-M-Y. Oh. It's pretty much Sinatra in JavaScript. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, and and uh, I will have to look at it more because I, I'm not familiar with it enough. But um, so Sammy is Sinatra in JavaScript in the sense that it's trying to do the same kind of URL routing stuff, but yeah. with the local hash URL, change. Hash, uh, yeah. So that's something that definitely needs an answer, and that might well be a good one. Um, you know, I should say that what I'm doing for now is uh, I have Rails on the back end, right? Um, so I'm still using the kind of controller stuff that I think is not necessary. Sure. Um, I'm not using Active Record because that's not, you know, uh, the models I have don't map to that. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm slowly building up incomplete answers to this, and that's one that I'll definitely look at. Okay. Um, yeah. Hey, so I don't know if you saw this, but in my blog post where I announced that I'm moving to Sprout Core, I actually cited this talk. So yes, you cited the version of this talk at DjangoCon when I had even fewer answers. Cool. Um, so I actually agree with the core. I'm going to heckle, if that's okay. Yes, please. Sweet. You're good at it, so, you know. Awesome. Um, so I agree with the core of this argument that yeah. we need better answers on the client side. Um, I don't agree with two things about the rail stuff. Well, yeah. three. One. Uh, I guess maybe Django people aren't thinking about this, but we really are. Um, and two, I don't agree that the design principles are fatal. I think I've said this to you before, but yes. um, the reason for that is that a lot of, once you, it's true, a lot of stuff has to be on the client. That is the next thing, right? But there's things that still have to be on the server, like authentication, payments, Absolutely. syncing. Yes. And these things are good to have a framework, and they also Absolutely. interact with HTTP, right? So. Yep. Um, that, that, the thing that we actually spent all the time since Rails 1.1 on has been improving HTTP support, and that's also what we're spending time in Rails 3.1 on. So even if you don't use the view layer at all, which I am going to find myself doing less and less, yeah. having essentially a Rack++, but way better than Rack++, right? Like actually something that is really, that has a really awesome HTTP API is really valuable. So uh, I agree, and I would be perfectly willing to believe that everything that's been done since Rails 1.1 is still useful, but what I would like to see is actually throwing out the Rails 1.1 derived stuff 
uh, and uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the basic underlying stuff of views and controllers, right? If you can imagine a Rails that threw out view and controllers and still had you know, uh, the, the, all of the other support stuff that you're talking about, that's great. But then what you need to do also is you need to you know, try to build something that gives you the same level of support for this model of web applications that Rails did for the 2004 model of web applications, so, right? And that's the, that's the real pull. Right? It's not so much that you know, half of Rails is now useless, which I, I would say is true, but is less interesting. It's that we need to replace that with something else. Right? Yes. Um, and that hasn't yet been done. Right? And so that's when I say it's obsolete. It's not so much that you know, uh, we need to throw it away as that we need to build something new. And you know, it's really easy for me to stand up here and say that. Right? But hopefully I'll, I'll do some work on actually doing that. Now that I'm actually working in Ruby again, uh, yes. which hasn't been true for about 10 years. Um, the third thing is uh, the request response cycle is not obsolete, right? If you have HTTP, you still have request response. So I don't think Absolutely. controllers are obsolete. I think Active Record it could be obsolete in a lot of cases, especially with a lot of web services. And I think the view layer is obviously obsolete. But having a thing that takes a request and returns JSON is, is the Rails controller model. So I think that seems OK. Yes, although it's assuming you know one of the fundamental design decisions around Rails, I think, I would say, is uh, sort of the URL routing model, right? And, and yes. that, I think, is no longer necessary and no yeah. longer interesting, right? Clean URLs, who cares? What I would say is the anymore. same thing I said last time, which is, sure, but it, I don't see any win in actively making that ugly, right? So right. Rails is a so, bunch of work to do that. It doesn't really matter, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But so this, this partly just comes down to, I mean, again, we've had this discussion before, but it's much more fun to have it in public. Um, you know, it, it, it comes down to whether you care that there's a bunch of stuff in your framework that is no longer useful and whether you believe that that actively gets in the way. And I believe that it's important to strip things down to the core of what you're actually using uh, rather than to have stuff. And I think that that probably leads to more interesting developments, right? If you take the step of throwing away of using controllers, then there's sort of a vacuum there that you're going to be actively working to fill. And if you just say, well, OK, I just won't use that part of the framework, um, then uh, it, you know, the, the potentials for surprising elegance probably are, are less. We should probably let someone else. Yes, I think that. Even I though you do such an excellent job. I just want to say I think that's true. OK. So uh, thanks for give me a chance to talk, but I'm pretty much going to say the same things from a different angle. Yeah. Uh, as the small talk people know very well, the model view controller paradigm is very old, and it's not supposed to be just applicable to web applications. I believe it actually started with desktop applications. I might yes. be wrong on that. But whether or not Rails does a good job of mapping those, uh, that design pattern correctly has nothing to do with whether or not it's an applicable design pattern. For example, you, you were saying that the, the back end essentially API application on these, uh, on these AJAX heavy applications of the modern mm -hmm. world still has to exist. It's, it sends over JSON instead of HTML. Yep. That's just another form of the view, right? Whether or not we're going to be using templates for that view, maybe they should be presenters instead that transform the stuff into JSON, is simply good decoupling to, to, to have something in between the model and what is going to be presented to the front end. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. The controller is simply the orchestration layer. And I believe that the, the, it, for a web application, having good routes there, even if it's just for APIs, is very important for people being able to discover your, your API in the back end and make use of it. So uh, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with you that the model view controller paradigm as a kind of overarching design is still very much useful here, right? What I'm not sure is if the specific implementation in Rails, and, and I think MVC gets, I mean, it, it can mean so many different things, right? MVC as sort of used to talk about Rails like web apps actually has very little to do, honestly, with MVC as the kind of desktop UI paradigm, uh, you know, started in small talk. Uh, they're very, very different things. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's still a useful architecture to think about. I, I disagree that it's useful to think of the JSON as a view. I think it's much better to think of the JSON as a representation of the model. Uh, because well, well, when you're exposing a public API, um, there's been many times when I've, when I've written API applications where I end up finding myself putting logic in, in the model layer about what, uh, what aspects of the JSON should be visible to the, uh, to the application Absolutely. using the API. And I think that's a poor design. I realized that that should actually be pushed into the view and controller layers. 
Uh, sure. So whether or not that's actually in the model objects or whether or not that's in a, in a layer above it. But uh, I mean, I think the more interesting thing from my point of view is that on the client side, you have, you know, it may be a view with respect to the server side, but with re respect to the client side, it's definitely a model. Because one of the things that, one of the advantages of this style of application is that you have this one JSON model that you can actually build many client side views on top of it, right? So you have this piece of JSON, and if someone wants to switch from seeing you know, a list view to a detail view, if the JSON that's available to it is rich enough, they don't have to make any request to the server, right? They're just representing that same bundle of data in a different way. And so I think it's, it, it's a mistake to think of it too closely as a view, and you're gonna end up having more requests than you need, and you're gonna end up uh, having more logic on the server than you need. Uh, and you could just be doing this stuff, and doing it much faster, remember, uh, on the client, uh, and also you know without the network traffic, which is useful. And obviously, there's a there's a balance there, right? I mean, if you have security issues, you know you don't want to expose your entire model. Obviously, you don't want to allow arbitrary writes to your model. You know, there's still lots of stuff that's going to have to happen in the model on the on the server. Um, but I think you at least need to be thinking about kind of MVC on the client, right? Of I have this JSON model and I have multiple views that look at it and all interact with it. Yeah, I totally agree that the API should be considered sort of the model layer of a larger orchestration. But even that layer, if it's talking HTTP, I, I feel needs the, the MVC model inside of it. So anyway, thank you very much for your talk. Okay. Hi, thanks for the talk. I think it's really timely, and this is where everything's going. So I'm glad this is now uh, the message is starting to I think get out bigger. But talking a little bit about the message, um, yeah. I'm a little hesitant on some of the words used in the slides. And I want to be maybe a little bit easier for people to, I think, swallow. So I think yeah. a big disservice that happened in our community in a large was the NoSQL term. Because I think it drew this really big division between people who are using relational databases every day to get their job done and mm -hmm. have absolutely no problem doing it. Yeah. And then, oh, but I feel like I should be doing the same because I should know SQL, but I am doing SQL. So I, I, I would throw out that we should use less MVC, less HTML, and not necessarily the word no, because as a lot of other people have pointed out, there's still a huge room for Rails and a lot of these frameworks that coexist to help push this package to the client. And I, I don't want to draw a division to have people go down these routes and throw away a lot of stuff we've been doing. So I'd rather see more of a evolution than a revolution. Totally. Because I think this is going to happen anyway, but it's kind of a messaging marketing point that I just you know, want to bring and, up. And, and as I, you know, so I'm a pragmatist. I'm still using Rails on the server, right? So I mean, I'm, I'm saying it's obsolete. I'm still using it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is an intentionally provocative talk, and I'm intentionally using provocative but, language. But uh, Twitter is already, um, I mean, you know, put the, the meme out there, and, and it's going to propagate. So it's already happening. And it's good. I, I think we should be talking mm -hmm. about this. But as we proceed, I really, as a community, I, I, I want us to think more about less, not no. Great, so. great. Uh, less HTML. All, all that, that, that can, that I'm, I'm happy to adopt that as a motto. Yeah. Uh, so, but thank you. Yeah, good <laughs> points. I enjoy yeah. the conversation. Thank you. So I have uh, more partial solutions. Yes, great. So one of the problems that people have with this is how does SEO work? What about my layout yes. and the initial page rendering? And there's a project out there that I'm not responsible for, but someone did that's awesome, which is called the Ruby Racer, which binds the V8 runtime to Ruby. Yeah. So what you can do is you can have V8 running on the server side and pass it your Ruby objects, yeah. and then you can run all of your templates, which will then you only have to run once. And if they're string interpolation templates or builder templates, either way, yes. those functions that turn data yes. into a presentation, you can run that then on the server side and have that SEOable and crawlable and indexable and serve clients that don't support JavaScripts like Blackberry phones and whatever else you need to. So I don't think there's a great project out there yet that has like used JavaScript for your views on right. the server side, but there's definitely infrastructure there for interested parties to make that happen. Yeah, that's really interesting. And definitely one thing that I've been struggling with uh, is that as I kind of move code back and forth between the server layer and the client layer, because you sort of don't necessarily know when you're starting a, a project what code is, is going to want to be where, it's really annoying to have to port it back and forth between Ruby and JavaScript, right? Um, and you know, I haven't uh, taken the step of just saying, oh, well, I'll just use Node.js and write it all in JavaScript, partly because I find it kind of a pain to write JavaScript. It's a nice language, but uh, I'd rather write Ruby or Smalltalk. Um, but uh, anyway, so th those kinds of solutions are, are interesting in kind of bridging that gap a little bit. 
I wanted to give a shout out to uh, my buddy, Super Chris Nelson. You can find him on GitHub. He did a project where he wrote a little rack app that uh, bypassed the controllers and the, the, the restful controller where you kind of assume the CRUD and assume the certain routes. Uh, it would inspect the URLs and just pass it right straight to the models and then just return JSON back out. Okay. So it was a really thin layer between allowing you to use like active model with whatever mm -hmm. and use rack to just hit right on to the uh, hit right onto the models and it, it worked out really well to have a, a rich Java cl JavaScript client with Ruby for the server. Cool. I should ask how many people are are building apps in this style right now? Yeah, right. So everyone has this problem, more or less. Rich, I think you're living in a bubble. Oh. <laughs> I no. work at Twitter, of course I'm I know, in a bubble. and it's, it, it, it's a really loud bubble, but um, <laughs> no, I, if you look at the sheer number of web applications that are gonna be built in the next three to four years, that is, that this pattern will be a major subset of them. If the frameworks we're building don't support the vast majority of those other ones, it won't be used. So I'm, I'm not, I, I love this model of programming, I really do. But realize that in enterprises and organizations that are trying to use this technology to replace the access database over there or the Lotus Notes application that was written over there, they're not gonna go to this model yet. That so why not, right? I mean, because <laughs> the answer could just be that we don't have the framework support for it yet. It, it, it's hard enough for them to get actually doing HTML. I mean, but believe it this, or not, is, it is, seems is, is ridiculous. Is it obvious that this model with proper framework support is harder, right? I mean, this, this sounds sort of like the argument, you know, no, uh, I mean, but th they're, that people would have made six years ago that, you know, well, no one's going to use this Rails thing, right? Because they have to learn Right, over. but so, the transition from something like, um, you know, something with Java, Java templates to Ruby and Rails is actually straightforward. Yeah, it's a different language. Yeah, it's a dynamic language and everything else like that. But all that aside, the paradigm is very similar, right, to doing something with hibernate models. Trust me, I don't want to go there. I'm just saying <laughs> that, uh, you know, from a paradigm perspective, it's very similar. Yeah. To go to something where, well, what we're doing is we're actually going to push all this into the view and we're going to do all this stuff with, with, now, realize Microsoft, who introduced a lot of this stuff, as much as we bang on them, but the ability of actually doing asynchronous requests was because of them. And, um, you know, they were building really robust client-side applications a long time before any of this stuff happened. You know, and um, they tried to push this model and everyone pushed back because they understand this kind of server-centric model. It's the mainframe mentality, right? This is client-server computing. Mm -hmm. right. For some reason, IT loves mainframe programming. And we've all been developing mainframe applications for the last five or six, seven years. That's yep. what the web's been about. Yep. It's, right, now we gotta go back to, to client-server computing and then everyone goes, oh my God, client-server computing is hard. And eventually the paradigm will, I mean, I think it's swinging that way, just like it did in the 80s, but I think it's gonna swing back eventually, unfortunately, to this kind of server-centric model. But right now, I'm, I'm hoping that. I'm just saying from the vast majority of people that will be building web applications, I believe, in the next three to four years, they're going to be traditional web applications. I'm talking about the number of apps. I'm not yep. talking about yep. Twitter and you know these other sites that people use every day. I think they'll move more to this model. but you don't see the other ones. You'll yep. never use the other ones, but they're there and they're being built. And we need frameworks that do that. And if that framework can also support this model too, it won't be optimal, but if you could actually support both, I think that that is high value because then you give people an ability to say, hey, we can transition you using say Rails to this model and now we can transition you here, so. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, um what you say makes sense. I, I, I generally dislike sort of that kind of compromise solution. I would rather see something that is only useful to the small subset of people that are sort of on the bleeding edge. Um, and you know, if, if ignoring the enterprise is wrong, I don't want to be right. Uh, no, wait, how does that work? Anyway, um, but um, yeah, you know, so, so, so my, my aesthetics are towards, uh, uh, pushing the envelope and and sort of figuring out what the people you know the people in this room probably you know enough people put up their hands saying we're building apps this way um, that I think there's a need for uh, uh, framework support for this 
And yes, if we can sort of make it backwards compatible and still work uh, you know, well enough with the old stuff, that's great, that's a win. Um, but this is sort of the, you know, the, 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 again, the argument of, of whether, or not, whether or not we actually can get there without throwing out the other stuff. And, and I would argue that you know, the most interesting new designs happen when you go back and throw away the old design decisions because your constraints have changed. And so I'm loath to continue to, to take on the constraints that, that I'm sort of hoping that we're rid of. Um, but um, you know, that's I, 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 I live in a particular world, and that's what makes sense in that world. And I recognize that there are other worlds that I've been actively running away from where, where that doesn't work. I, I need to butt in here yeah. and put an end to this fascinating conversation. <laughs> we're, we're a little over time. Yeah. So, do you have uh, anything in conclusion, or are we done? No, no, we're good. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much.